So like I said, such as I have, I give you. It's found in Acts chapter 3 from verse 6. Um, Peter, then Peter said, silver and gold have I known. But such as I have, I'm reading from the old King James now, such as I have, I give unto thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and, and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. In the Amplified Translation from verse 3, it says, So when he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them to give him a gift. And Peter directed his gaze intently at him. And so did John. I believe they were looking for something, whether he had faith in his heart or something. And said, look on us or look at us. And the man paid attention to them, expecting that he was going to get something from them. But Peter said, silver and gold I do not have. But what I do have, that I give to you. In the name or in the use of the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Then he took hold of the man's right hand and with a firm grip and raised him up. And at once his feet and ankle bones became strong and steady. And leaping forth, he stood and began to walk. And he went into the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. Now, you can tell from what God is laying on my heart to share with us is that something in me wants us to wake up to the real church, that is the early church, the way Jesus Christ wants the church to function. It's meant to be a supernatural group of people. It's not meant to be a normal set of people just walking their normal life. There should be the element of the supernatural. And it's available to every one of us. In fact, some of us already have some testimonies to that effect. But I want to see more and more people have these testimonies. I want to see more and more people walk in the supernatural. So today's message and the series I'm doing, such as I have, I give unto you, can be seen as a digging into learning what we have and how to use it. Learning what we have and how to translate what we have spiritually into the natural. And that's what the early church did. Silver or gold have I known, but such as I have, I give you. Hallelujah. We can only give what we have. The question is, what do we have in Christ like Peter had? There are many things we have that we do not know about or we're not taking full advantage of them. You see, a lot of times, sometimes it's not so much as not knowing the Bible. It's not walking in the consciousness or the reality of the word. Peter said, such as I have. What did Peter have? I said, Peter has an understanding of God's plan of salvation, which included healing for all. He included forgiveness of sin as well and acceptance before the Father God himself. He also knew how to walk in the power of God made available to us through our Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to see that Peter knew what he had. From the way, well, from the observation we have made on those, in that experience that Peter had there, he knew he had the power of God. He knew he had the name of Jesus. He knew he had faith in that name and faith in the power of God. And he knew that the guy also had an expectancy to receive something from them. So he offered the guy what he had and the guy received it. So he pulled the guy up and the guy was whole. Because further down in Acts, just in Acts chapter 3, from verse 12. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, men of Israel, when people were excited about what was going on and all of that. Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us? Peter was trying to let them understand that there was no peculiarity about himself doing what he did. That by the covenant that we have with God through Jesus Christ, this was available to every believer. And he was talking to the Jews. That means that the Jews had something similar. It says, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this or why look so intently at us as though by our own power or godliness we made this man walk? The God of Abraham is now referring to the Jews' gods. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of our fathers glorified his son, servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied. Can you see Peter trying to use every experience, an opportunity to present the gospel to them again? 
I want us to learn these things because I want to see many more believers walk in this reality of it. Some of you should be able to pray for COVID sicknesses and they would disappear. Some of you should be able to pull the cripple up. And Peter was letting them know that it's not because I'm an apostle. It's not because I'm one of the disciples of Jesus. It's available to us and every one of us can walk in it. So my challenge to you is to say, what will it take for you to walk in the supernatural? So he went on in verse, uh, from verse 12. When Peter saw it, I'm re repeating verse 12 again. He responded to people, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why do you look intently at us as though by our own power or godliness we made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate. And when he was determined to let him go, verse 14 says, but you deny the Holy One and the just and ask for a murderer to be granted you. Verse 15 says, and kill the prince of life whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this great soundness in the presence of you all. Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did your father, your rulers. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of his prof, all his prophets, that Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So I'm saying that the same Peter said that we have like precious faith and have all things that pertain to life and godliness. It's important that we understand. Let's, let me spend time introducing this subject well because I want us to see that the supernatural is not an option. The supernatural is not if you want or if you don't want. Maybe God will, maybe God won't. The supernatural is a part and parcel of the Christian faith, the one delivered by Jesus Christ to us. That the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, all that he went through because for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. He himself said when he was ending his ministry, he said, these signs will follow them that believe. In my name, they will cast out devils. In my name, they will bind, I mean, whatever, if they take any deadly thing, will not hurt them. In my name, they will speak in tongues and all of that. And when they lay hands on the sick, the sick will recover. I want to challenge us not to be content with a non-supernatural Christian faith. Because I find out that if we are not careful, we will allow ourselves to be content with a non-supernatural Christian faith. And I'm so grateful to God that when I got born again, I got born again, I think it was a revival that was going on on our campus in those days. But I got born again, and before long I was operating in the gifts of the Spirit, we were laying hands on the sick and things were happening, but we were spending quality time in prayer. So when we began to get those results, it made me see that not only was God real, but he was real in my life. So I want to challenge us because a lot of times it's very easy to have what I would call uh, a, a, an intellectual Christian faith. A, a, a Christian faith that is good based on the Bible but there's no supernatural dimension at the, attached to it. There's no supernatural element to it. It's just, oh, Jesus died on the cross and I'm a believer and I'm born again and all of that. I want to challenge us today to wake up to the supernatural. Because you see, if Peter and John, who pulled that guy up on, in the book of Acts chapter 3, if they had walked past the guy, that's it. Nothing would have happened. God would not come from heaven to come and heal that guy. Neither would, you know, God regret, oh, my people are not. No, they just didn't wake up to it. That's it. But thank God they did. The guy has been there for years and he has been begging for arms and people have given him. But this time around, somebody said, look on us. And I want to challenge us, if you don't have that element of adventure in your system to step out beyond the natural, then you will, may not experience the supernatural. And you may make it look like, it's for others, not for you. 
or it's for those who are called, I want you to know you are also called. Everybody has a basic calling to become a child of God. Everybody has a basic calling to become a believer. So if you are a believer, the supernatural is available to you. And that's what this message is about. But it will not be enough for you to just intellectually absorb it again and use it as part of your additional knowledge. No. My own goal in sharing it is to get you to be challenged enough to say, such as I have, because you now know what you have, I give. You, can't know, you now know the purpose for which you are given, and then you are now willing to act on it. Hallelujah. You are willing to act on it. And I want you to know something. When you begin to experience the supernatural in your life, and through you, others are experiencing it, it will take a long while for the enemy to convince you otherwise that maybe God is not real or maybe God doesn't love you. No, you will know beyond a shadow of doubt that not only does God love you, he's willing to demonstrate his power through you because such as you have, you can demonstrate it. All right, so I want us to start by looking at what Peter said. He said, why look on us as if our own holiness or godliness we made this man whole? But Jesus Christ, that God has glorified by raising him up from the dead, and faith in that name has made this man whole. So if you look back, let's just cast our minds on that Acts chapter 3. When Peter looked to the guy, he looked intently at him. They must be looking for something. Because I think in Acts 14 as well, Peter and Paul was preaching. And the Bible says he looked upon one man who was crippled. And he saw that he had faith. He, he, he had the inspiration or the, uh, the conviction in his heart that that guy had faith to be healed. And he just shouted, rise up in the name of Jesus. And the guy rose up. So, I mean, I, I think Peter must be looking for that kind of expectation in that guy's heart. That he looked intently at him and said, silver or gold have I none to give you, but such as I have I give you. So Peter knew what he had. And then when he was explaining, he said, faith in that name made this man whole. That means the man had faith because he must have heard something. Faith coming by hearing, hearing by the word. So faith has made the man whole, but somebody helped his faith. Somebody demonstrated faith as well. So what do we do? Let's start with the faith element so that we see how far we go in today's message. You see, the same Peter who had faith in the name of Jesus and faith to see a miracle happen. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, Peter said, Simon Peter, a bond servant, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know what that tells me? Peter himself said he's writing to those who have obtained a like precious faith. That means that what faith Peter had, he's saying you have it. If you're one of those who are born again. He's saying those who have obtained a like precious faith. He didn't stop there. It says, those who have obtained a like precious faith with us by the rational God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Verse 2 says, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Verse 3 says, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which I have been given uh, sorry, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these ye may, be, ye may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Wow. So Peter is saying two things here. Number one, that we have obtained a light precious faith. And number two, his divine power has given made to, available to us everything that pertains to life, on earth and godliness, living a godly life. And he says, all of it has come through the knowledge, through the knowledge, through the knowledge. So we want to start with faith. Because I said, knowing what we have should produce confidence in us. Our faith is what is needed to translate what we have in the spirit realm into the natural. I think my wife, Pastor Funke, was saying in her last message on uh, perfect, fear, perfect love cast out fear, she was saying that, those who have obtained a light, sorry, um, uh, the spirit of just men made perfect. She made a very powerful point by saying that when you got born again, your spirit was made perfect. I think that's a profound statement that she made there. Because that's been an argument for people over the years. When the Bible says we are like spiritual children, we're going to grow up. Is it our spirits that was growing up? 
But she explained it, and I, I agree with her because that's the conviction I have as well in the Word of God, that the spirit man does not grow. The spirit man exists the way it is. So I understand the spirit of just men made perfect. The, the maturity that we need is the maturity in allowing our recreated spirits to train our emotions, train our minds, train our will, train our, the core of our being, like our heart. When we allow that kind of training, and they all come in harmony with the reality of the spirit, our spirit, our recreated spirits, then we have come into maturity. So maturity in our context is not our spirits becoming like babies, then growing up. Our spirits are already made perfect, and that's why they are equipped with all that we need. Our spirit man, in the realm of the spirit, healing is already there. In the realm of the spirit, all that Jesus sacrificed to make available is already there. In fact, when Paul was writing, the book of Ephesians lets us know. In Ephesians 1, for instance, I think verse 2 or 3, it says that all things that pertain to, sorry, that is Second Peter here. It says, we have been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And they all tie everything, every time, to our knowledge. You see, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings, all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. We're already blessed. So these blessings are existing in the realm of the spirit. But the question is, how do we translate them into the natural? It's always going to be a question because if you look at the body of Christ in general, there's been a, 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 a leaning off from the supernatural element to a large extent. But we need to challenge ourselves and get back into it. And let it become a norm amongst us. That every believer can lay hands on the sick and they will get healed according to what Jesus said. These signs will follow them that believe. Every believer can speak in tongues. Every believer can speak to their mountains, their personal problems. And they will expect and the problems will go. Why? The power to make it happen is already existing. It's not existing at the disposal of God saying, well, I love you. Well, you paid your tithe yesterday, so let me bless you with my power. No, it's already available to us. That's why Paul wrote in Ephesians 1 from verse 17 when he said, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Father of glory, may grant unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding, being enlightened that you may know the hope of his calling. So there's a calling and there's a hope of his calling. Then you may know the, the glorious inheritance that he has in the saints, the riches of his glory. And then you might know the exceeding greatness of his power that is at work toward those who believe. What that means is that that power is available in us. The same he wrought when he raised Jesus from the dead. Hallelujah. So what that tells you is this, that not only do you have power, not only you have the calling, you have the grace, everything that you need according to the word of God has been made available. But they're all available in the realm of the spirit. They're not available in the natural. So if you look at yourself from the natural standpoint, you will be tempted to live your life purely by the natural. Tempted to live your life purely by your observation of what is natural and mentally real to you. And if that is the limitation we've put on ourselves, somebody needs to begin to get challenged enough to say, you know what, I want to move beyond that. And by the grace and the strength of the Holy Spirit, you can. You can. Don't let the environment of the mental uh, uh, limitations keep you down. So Paul was saying that you and I have the power of God at work toward us. So when you lay hands on the sick, it's the power that is at work towards you that flows out of you to effect a healing and a cure. What if you lay hands on a believer who already has that power in him as well? So the power from outside will attract the power from inside. So the two of them will meet and the sickness has no choice but to drive, be driven out. Hallelujah. But I want you to wake up to that fact that there is an element of the supernatural that if, we're not, if care is not taken, we will keep allowing ourselves to be limited to the natural and we keep allowing ourselves to think that there's no way we can produce like they did. So let's see. Our faith is needed to translate what we have in the spirit realm into the natural realm. Faith has to do with believing in our hearts, speaking with our mouth and acting on the word of God. 
So Peter knew what he had. The power that raised Christ from the dead is at work in him, according to Ephesians 1. The name of Jesus Christ and the right to exercise faith in obedience to the instructions in the word of God, there are things that he knew that God has given Jesus a name above every name, according to Philippians. And at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. So you have confessed that, you have bowed, you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. But now through you, every knee can bow. Every sickness and disease can bow. That name has already been given. That name has been released from heaven. It's a name that is above every name. He obtained that name when he was raised from the dead. Now God has already given him a name because when he was on earth, he gave authority to his disciples and they were able to do a lot of things in his name but when he left you know and God exalted him and put him as his own right hand the beauty and the power in that name went to another level because now if you know the name and you know you have the knowledge of that name. You have the knowledge of how he obtained a more excellent name. In fact, that's what the Bible says. That when he rose from the dead, he obtained a more excellent name. God gave authority to that name when he rose from the dead at another level. So when he told his disciples, go in my name and make disciples of all nations, he was not joking at all. That name is the name that every knee will bow to of things in heaven and things on earth. Think about it. And you know what I found out? That name Jesus is the name, because when you look at what Paul wrote, he said God gave uh, the same power that raised him from the dead and made him head and gave to the church. In other words, the goal of giving him that name was not just for his own sake. It was for the sake of the church. So when you understand, that's why I say, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatever you lose on earth shall be The name of Jesus is the name given to Jesus as he represents the head of the body of Christ. And there's nobody whose head bears a different name from his arms or his legs. <laughs> so what that tells you is this, that the glorified Jesus Christ obtained a name and that name is available to you. And what that means is that you can use that name and the authority behind that name will respond to whatever challenges you are facing. That is awesome. But how come we are not waking up to that reality? Is it because we lack faith? No, we don't lack faith. We lack knowledge of the quality of faith that we have. Because we've been used to our natural faith. There's a natural faith and there's a supernatural faith. When the Bible says in Romans 10, 17, that faith coming by hearing and hearing by the word of God, he's telling us the fact that the faith we got for salvation came by hearing the word of God. Now, that faith did not go. Because when you think about it, when you were a stark sinner, an unbeliever, you were living in sin, and somebody preached the gospel to you, and you believed, and your spirit got recreated, that's the most powerful miracle you can imagine. For somebody who is a stark sinner for, to get his spirit recreated. Now, how did he have the faith to let that happen? That has, in fact, in Ephesians, he says that uh, we're saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God. Which one is the gift of God? Both the salvation and the faith. They are both the gift of God. So what that means is that the faith of God was imparted through the gospel to this person. And this person utilized that faith of God to receive salvation to recreate his spirit. <clears throat> Excuse me. So when you understand that, then it means that we are the ones not taking advantage of the quality of faith that we have. Because we think it's natural human faith. You see, the supernatural faith built, is built on what you cannot see. None of us have been to heaven to see God or see Jesus. But we believe what the Bible says. And because we believe, faith is imparted to us. And that faith is not our human faith. Is a supernatural faith. That's exactly what Jesus had in mind in John chapter 14 from verse 12. When he said, most assuredly I say unto you, he who believes in me, the works that I do shall he do also. He will do also. And greater work than this he will do. Because I go to my father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. That the father may be glorified in the son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Wow. 
That is awesome. Let's even talk about the works that Jesus did, not to talk about greater than what he did. What would make Jesus say to his disciples and to us that the works he did, we can do also? It doesn't make sense in the natural. We were born of parents. We were of the descendant of Adam. We have sin in our nature. You were born of divine birth. How can you now say the works you did, we can do also? That means that he's telling us something that we don't understand. It's either we look at it and say, well, that's what the Bible says, but. Or we look at it and say, if the Bible says it, I believe it. Jesus must be saying it because he says he who believes in me. That means that that believing in him must be the foundation, must be the element of salvation. It must be the transmission of something that he has into that person. He who believes in me, the works that I do he will do also. I want us to take note of that, that your believing in Jesus has transmitted the God kind of faith into you. You know, actually, when you look at Mark 11's account, when Jesus said, have faith in God, the literal meaning is have the faith of God. When he went on to say, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea. The literal meaning is have the faith of God or have the God kind of faith. So that you can say to the mountain, be removed and be cancelled to the sea. And we not doubt in your heart, but I believe that those things which you say shall come to pass. You shall have whatsoever you say. Wow. That's the God kind of faith. Because when God was creating, he too spoke and things happened. Anytime God speaks like that in the, or spoke like that in the, altar, in, the, in the creation time, the Bible says the spirit of God hovered and the power of God was present. So the speaking gave instruction to what the power will produce. And that's the way God expects you to operate. Why? Because he made you in his image and after his likeness. I think we should know that, that we are not born again just to practice Christian religion. We're not born again just to be seen as one of the many Christians around here. We're born again to be representatives of God the Father and his will being done on planet Earth. That's why Jesus taught us that prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, worship. Thy kingdom come, government. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Demonstration of government power, kingdom power. Thy will be done, righteousness, peace and joy, the kingdom of God is God's government on me. When I submit to Jesus as my Lord, submit to the word as final authority, submit to the leading of the Holy Spirit, what I'm saying is I'm submitting to the government of God righteousness, peace, and joy. Thy kingdom come. You see, those things are not just wishes. They're not just utterances. They are expressions of reality. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. Wherever his kingdom is allowed to come, his will can be done on earth as it is in heaven. So if I look at it from a personal level, I'll say, Father, your kingdom come upon my life. Your will be done in my life as it is in heaven. There's no sickness in heaven, so sickness you must go from my life. There's no confusion in heaven. There's no anxiety in heaven. Say amen, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So you start at the personal. So every time you look at any kingdom principle, any biblical principle, always look at the application on a personal level at a corporate level, then at a global level. Don't always look at it from one angle alone. Some people look at it only from the global angle and say, how can his will be done on planet Earth with all the wickedness going on today? When you look at the local church or the church in general, you look at so many things going on in the church. So that's why a lot of times when people say those prayers, it means nothing to them. Why? Because they don't understand there's a personal side there's a corporate side and then there's a global side. On the personal side, some people major only on the personal side and leave every other thing out. No, it's supposed to be phase one, phase two, phase three. That's why I said different levels of God's operation in your life. If you don't understand different levels of what God wants to do in your life, then you won't appreciate the process it's taking you through. That's what Joseph's and co went through. That's what the David went through. David said the God who delivered me from the lion and the bear, he would deliver me from this. So there was a personal side and David got the victory on the personal side, lion and the bear. 
I mean, can you imagine a young boy coming home and say, Dad, Dad, a lion came and picked up the sheep, so I ran away. And the dad would say, thank God, you are safe. But that wasn't David. David faced the lion and delivered the sheep from the lion, and he killed the lion. But nobody was there. But that's the personal side. And that's where a lot of believers don't understand that God wants you to have a conviction from a personal victory. That's when I encourage you to step out. It's actually helping your own confidence, helping your own faith, helping your own demonstration of God's power in your own life. You need that. So there's a personal side. So when it now became a situation where Goliath was intimidating the entire army of Israel, David said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he's defying the armies of God? Wow. If David did not have confidence in his personal walk with God, if David did not have confidence in knowing that God delivered him from the lion, God delivered him from the bear, David would not have the confidence to face the Goliath at the corporate level. And that's the problem. And I want you to, you see, you must start stepping out to lay hands on the sick. You must. You must start believing God for the supernatural. Even when it looks like nothing is happening around you, don't give up because it is not your human faith you are demanding to operate. It is not your human power. That's what Peter was saying. It's not your godliness. It's nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with God and his intention and his purpose and how he demonstrated his own faith to produce through the life of us. Our elder brother, Jesus Christ, say amen and how he wants you to demonstrate it. You see, as long as you relegate it back to yourself, you will always see the failure element there. Why? Because your nature, your nurture, and your culture have trained you in failure. That's what people don't understand. Your nature, nurture, and culture have trained you to be moved by what you see, be moved by what you hear, be moved by what you think, be moved by what you feel. And what does it, what does it, what Satan does? He makes sure that everything around you by what you see, what you hear, what you feel, all of those things have been designed to leak your faith and to cause you not to have confidence in the supernatural faith that is in you. That's what we call unbelief. Remember when, you know, I think in Romans 4, when uh, Paul was writing, he says that Abraham believed God and was accounted to him for righteousness. That Abraham, Abraham, Abraham did not consider his own body dead or the deadness of Sarah's womb. You know what that tells you? That when you consider the natural Unbelief can rise up in your heart and it will reduce or steal completely the supernatural faith that is in you to get results. And that's why a lot of believers are, re are I mean, reclining to a lack of supernatural faith in their own lives. You need to stop it. You need to stop it completely. You need to recognize that unbelief can be at work in your heart alongside with the faith because the faith you have, nobody's going to take it from you. The supernatural faith of God you've got is there. If you never use it, it doesn't change it. Because it's there. That's what led you to, be self, to, to, to get born again. You got born again based on that faith. You got born again based on the supernatural faith of God, the God kind of faith that is awaiting you to speak to the mountain, that is awaiting you to act like God's word is true, that is awaiting you to believe in the identity you have in Christ, that is awaiting you to do things that are supernatural so that the God kind of faith on the inside of you will produce results like it did in the life of Jesus Christ. <laughs> I tell you what, this is what this is about. So what we're looking at here is this. I says we have the name of Jesus like Peter did. We have the word of God because I said, such as I have, I give. So what do you have? You have the name, you have the word, you have the blood of the covenant because you have a covenant with the Father God. And all that the sacrifices of Jesus made available to us belongs to us. Not only should we know who we are in Christ and what we have and what we can do, we need to know how to do what we need to do so that what we have can bring about blessings to us and to humanity around us. Now, this is what Peter did. He not only knew who he was in Christ. I want you to know that it's a whole lesson to just dig into who we are in Christ. I mean, you're a new creature. All things are passed away. God is a spirit. He made you in his image and likeness. In Romans 8, my popular one now from verses 8, verses 29 and 30, that we have been predestined to be conformed to the image of the song. Hallelujah. You and I have been predestined to be conformed to the image of the song. 
that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And verse 30 says, him who he predestined, he also called. Him who he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Hallelujah. And every one of us who is born again, we have been called, we've been justified, we've been glorified, and we've been predestined. We can, in our expression of it can differ from person to person, but the same word of God is true for every one of us. So that tells you straight away that you have the name of Jesus, you have the word of God, you have the blood of the covenant, and all the sacrifices Jesus made available to you belongs to you. So you need to be established. That's why when I was in the entering one level to another, I talked about the foundation. It's always a foundational problem. You see, who are you? You can define yourself from the natural standpoint. I am so-and-so, I come from so-and-so nation, I'm married or single. That's who you are in the natural. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I think from verse 14 or 16, it says, Henceforth know we no man after the flesh. For we once knew Christ after the flesh, but henceforth know we him thus no longer. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are what? Passed away. So he's talking about two identities. Number one identity, your natural identity. You see, the spiritual does not deny the natural. The spiritual does not say the natural no longer exists. The spiritual simply says the natural has been taken care of. And true spirituality demands retraining of the natural so that there is an alignment or a, confirm or a conformity to the spiritual. That's why true spirituality is not religiosity. True spirituality is not an imposition on the natural. True spirituality is a recognition of the limitations of the natural. As we embrace the true spiritual, then we can retrain the natural in the light of true spirituality. True spirituality never, ever makes the natural makes it look like it's us, just mind over matter. No. When somebody is sick, for instance, and the body pain and all the discomfort are there, true spirituality does not say the sickness is not there. True spirituality does not deny the existence of the discomfort. True spirituality says, as far as the realm of the spirit is concerned, by his stripes you were healed. That means heaven has produced the healing now, how do we transmit that healing into the natural? Jesus told us, he said, you lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. That's one way. And another place in Mark 11 tells us we can speak to the mountain and the mountain will obey us. That's another way. And then in another place we can see that when we pray, we can position ourselves for true spirituality to come forth. What do I mean by that? A lot of times when the Bible says we should pray, really what we're doing is coming into harmony with what has already been produced in the realm of the Spirit so that we can be transmitters on earth for that spiritual reality to come into physical experiential reality. For instance, when somebody wants to go and preach, maybe in a crusade, and he wants to expect God to bring salvation to many people. As far as heaven is concerned, salvation for all of them have been made available. Why? Because for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. And for the son loved the world, he died on the cross in obedience to his father. And his father raised him up. So if I was going to go and do a meeting and I'm going to believe God for many souls to be saved, it is not when I prayed that they will be saved that they are getting saved. My prayer operates on the premise that there is salvation available to these ones, I am now interceding for them that they as individuals will believe the word of God. Therefore, if they don't believe, according to the Bible, it says uh, their minds, their, the, 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 the things, it says the, 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 the minds are blinded, those who don't believe the gospel. So when you look at the weapons of our warfare and all can kind of mighty through God, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 from verse 3 to 5, you find that he talks a lot about thoughts, imagination, strongholds. 
Those are the things that I'm pulling down in the minds of these people who are coming to the conference or the crusade so that the gospel that is preached to them, they will believe it because the strongholds have been pulled down. The blindness in their minds have been undone. So as they believe it, the faith of God will be released into them and they can experience salvation. So you must understand the dynamics. Number one, salvation has been provided for. So it's not heaven that is producing the salvation just now. But as I prayed and interceded and spent time in prayer, I am pulling down the strongholds in the minds. I am casting down the imaginations of the minds. I am dealing with the issues that are hindering the manifestation of that salvation. Because I did that, when they now have come under the influence of my prayer and they believe the word of God, boom! Boom! The faith of God is released into them. Salvation is experienced. And the ones that need healing can get their healing. Why? Because the same sacrifice that made salvation possible also made healing possible. So when we understand these things, it will help us to understand that, yes, we should be very prayerful, but we should know what we're praying about. We should be very, because our faith depends. You see, you cannot have faith without a prayer life. That is so true. Because you can't just speak to mountains like that. Because like I said again, there's a personal side, there's a corporate side, and there's a global side. Now, some of you know me that I'm a global person in my thinking. <laughs> because I'm always thinking nations, thinking how might we get into more nations. But thank God for Pastor Funke. She has a very personalized pastoral and prophetic insight in the word. And I really recommend her messages. So what I'm saying here is this, that you must understand that the salvation is already provided as far as heaven is concerned. That's why anybody who comes to receive Christ as his Lord and Savior, you don't hear that the man of God went back and was praying, oh God, please make sure that those who confess Jesus and receive him, make sure that they are truly, truly saved, sir. No, because the provision has been made. If there's any hindrance to it, it's not God stopping that. It is something in the earth here, something in the minds here. And when I've done so for myself personally, I've pulled down strongholds in my own mind. I've dealt with unbelief. I've dealt with hurts and pain. Then I'm in a position to experience the power of God in my life. Then I'm also in a position to now transmit that power into many more lives. Why? Because the power is already available. Can I hear an amen? And that's why, like I was giving an example in Acts chapter 14, from verse 8. It says, And in Lystra, a certain man without strength, what in his feet was sitting, Acts 14, 8 to 10, a cripple from his mother's womb who had never walked. This man heard Paul speaking. Paul observing, Acts 14, 8 to 10. Paul observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, stand up straight on your feet. And he leaped and walked. Wow. Stand up straight on your feet. And he leaped and walked. So you can see once again, that this man was born crippled, never walked, but he heard Paul speaking. So faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word. So when he heard Paul speaking, faith came. But whose faith came? What quality of faith came? It was the faith of God. Because God's word acts like a container containing his love, containing his faith. So as that man heard Paul speaking, faith rose up in him. So when Paul gave the command, Paul, Bible says Paul observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed. Can you see that? He had faith to be healed. I like that. That Paul could say that somebody had faith to be healed. <laughs> May God open your understanding to know when somebody has faith to be healed. He said with a loud voice, stand up straight on your feet. And he leaped and walked. Wow. So that tells us straight away that when we talk about faith, I'll round up today's own on faith, and then the next one we'll do might be talking about other things too. So let's look at the faith element. How does faith come? It comes by hearing and hearing by the word. That's how faith comes. Hearing and hearing by the word. But what, what, what kind of faith comes by hearing? Ability to believe, ability to see into the realm of the spirit. When it's the word of God I'm hearing, not just human words, I can have the faith that God has. I can see what God saw, or what God has in mind, rather. And then 
These are the dynamics of faith. The believing, the confessing, the acting, and the meditating. Those are the dynamics of faith. If I believe God's word, I should make it my regular confession. Why do I need to make it my regular confession? Because it is through regular confession that the consciousness is built into me. A lot of people don't do that. You see, what you hear regularly builds a consciousness into you. It is through regular confession, and that has to be said over and over and over. It cannot be overemphasized. Through regular confession, I imbibe faith. Sorry, I imbibe a new consciousness. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When I lay hands on the sick, the sick will, be, will recover. I say those things to myself. That's why the word meditate in the Hebrew has to do with speaking to oneself, amongst other things. Meditate in English might look like just thinking. No. In the Hebrew, it has to be silent uttering. So when God was telling Joshua, this book of the Lord shall not depart out of your mouth. You will meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written. Then you will make your way prosperous, and you will have good success. So faith is the foundational issue there, whereby if I understand the dynamics of faith, that there's a believing with my heart. Believing means accepting. Then there's a confession with my mouth. Confession demands not just confessing of my sin, because that's what, when you have the word confession, people think of sins. No, there's a confession that has to do with building a consciousness. Then there is the acting on the word. Then there is the meditating through and through. What does that meditating in the English word do? It is the replacement of thoughts with the thoughts from the word of God. I want to round up today by stopping here and we'll continue this in the next series. But I hope you've got something out of this. So let me just reiterate the things I've talked about today. Number one, the title is Such as I Have, I Give Unto You. And I said, when we know what we have, we can give it. And our base text was John, uh, Acts chapter 3. And we looked at that and saw that Peter had faith in the name and all of that. And now in John 14, we saw that Jesus said, the works I do, you would do also. <coughs> Excuse me. Because you believe. And then we went on to say that the name of Jesus, the word of God are the things that we have and all of that. So we've looked at the subject of faith. The next one, we look at the subject of prayer. And that's very important that we do so that we can now build on that and see how far we go. Let us pray. Father, I want to thank you very much for what we've learned today. Help us, Lord, to be people of faith indeed. We believe, we confess. We speak to our consciousness and we build our consciousness into our hearts. And we now begin to expect the power of God to make the difference in our lives. And we thank you for it, Father. And I pray for everyone who has heard both in the hall and online that your power will be made available to them. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.